everybody. Welcome to Compliance Live. I'm Amanda Hosenfeld, and my guest today continues to not be Kaylin Gomka. Thank you so much for joining me, Angela Earnhardt. Now, Angela, you've been here before. I have. Yes. Just not in this studio. No, not in this one. No. This you, is my first time in this one. Yeah, you guested on our quality episode, like... When Compliance Live was just like a baby. Yes, I did. I had a great time, though. Yeah. Enjoy we, myself. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming back. You're welcome. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know that Mark from Accounting emailed me and said, I heard your recording today, Amanda. Would you please remember to tell everybody that this podcast is sponsored by Compliance Line? So thank you to Compliance Line for offering this space for valuable ethics and compliance-related content. I will return his email later and say, okay, Mark, I did it. <laughs> so we, we have a really great topic today. And I think it's so interesting because I never thought about what we're going to talk about today on, on this side of it. So we'll be talking about compliance officers as whistleblowers. And I, I asked uh, you, Angela, to step into this because you've been in the compliance space for what, 15, 16 years? Um, we're going on 17 in July. Seven. Okay, so yeah. you've seen some stuff. Yes, I have. Like, yes. For the, for the hotline in particular, we do have uh, protocols that we have in place. Um, if we get a compliance officer that's in a report, of course, we can't uh, send that report to them. They're usually the, the coordinators that are appended to these reports. So if we get one that's named in the report negatively um, for any you know, anything, we don't, we obviously can't send it to them. So, yeah. So just to clarify that on the hotline side, you get a call in or we get a call in mm -hmm. or a, an email in from the, the web that says, hey, this is wrong in the organization and this person is to blame for it. Right. Well, if that person is the person that we normally send these reports to, right. that, that it becomes a, a conflict of interest, right? right? Mm -hmm. What do we do in situations like that? Well, in most situations, there is someone set up as uh, called the corporate contact, the CC person. And so that will be the person that you call if any coordinator is mentioned. So if that doesn't, sometimes clients don't do that. They don't set that person aside for that particular reason. So then we have to just start with whoever else is on the list. And if that person is the only person that we send the report to, then at that that time it becomes a bigger issue. It's like a guessing game at that point. So then we have to call um, the actual corporate number and ask for someone to send that report to. So who if, else is in charge? Yeah, here? who else can? Because usually we just have that one contact. If that's the only person that's getting reports, so then it, it it gets really big. Do you think that's a problem for companies like like our clients that that they only have one person in charge of this stuff? Um, I think it could possibly be because if, if we couldn't if we couldn't reach someone else, then well, our hands are kind of tied because we have to we have to get this report to the client in the specific amount of time. So if that person's the only one that can get it, and we don't have any other means of contacting someone else, then we are just forced to send it to them, right. and then hope that you know it's like a hope strategy that that person knows that they can't investigate and gives it to someone else. Right. What a what an awkward situation to yeah. receive a report that's about you. Even if it's a little thing from, you know, they were mean to me to I I'm the accountant and I saw them embezzling money. Like it's right. It could have huge uh, implications, not just for like that department, but for the company as a whole. Yeah, and I and I have seen that. I have seen accounting issues come up. But luckily I have I have also been given another avenue to take where there are more than one there's more than one coordinator to send that report to right that's so interesting I never yeah. I, I don't know that a lot of our clients or our listeners even stop to think hey what if I'm named in this report right. what, what happens to that and what in right. our hands are kind of tied if there's nobody else on that list right that's fascinating yeah so our pre-production team is fabulous and they they gave us a, a, a great rundown on what exactly do whistleblowers who are also compliance officers have to gain or lose if they blow the whistle? Do compliance officers who blow the whistle have a different set of worries than, say, a regular employee that blows the whistle? I think so. I mean, I think um, they're in a position of obligation, even if all employees are 
supposedly in a position of obligation to to be loyal to the company and its investors or, or, or employees, whatever. I think that the compliance office specifically, it's their duty to handle it. So they, I, I would say it was a, it's a more awkward position for them if like, cause a lot of times these people are friends and they're, they're not just coworkers and things like that happen where you may have to quote unquote tattle on your buddy kind of thing. Right. So when we're talking about compliance officers being the whistleblowers, it, it feels like to me that's a more of a conversation of they're reporting up higher than their company, right? They're not reporting a compliance violation to their company because they are the compliance right. for Got that it. company. So that they would be reporting to the federal government, the Securities and Exchange right. Commission. Um, do compliance officers specifically have more to worry about? Because I know if I were to blow a whistle, if I were to say, well, this is happening in our organization, mm -hmm. I would go to uh, my direct manager, who's our CEO, and he would he would handle it. He would investigate it. But if he was the one that I was blowing the whistle on. I mean, that's a great scenario. Like if it's, if it's the CEO and there's no one higher than that person, then who do they report to? Yeah. And what's at stake? <laughs> yeah, that's like opens the door for retaliation. Right. That opens the door for, you know, potential, if you're in like a right to work state where you're not, you know, they unionized. Don't need a yeah. Right. They can just let you go for mm -hmm. no reason and you, what recourse do you have? Right. So our pre production team gave us a list of protections that are geared more towards compliance officers. So, you know, stop me if you heard these, okay. Angela. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act, mm -hmm. that's pretty big in yeah. compliance world. That came out of the Enron scandal in which uh, it offers protections for reporting corporate or accounting fraud. Mm -hmm. There's also the Dodd-Frank Act that came out of the Bernie Madoff scandal and the 2008 housing market collapse. Now, that protects whistleblowers who come forward on uh, securities violations or bribes to foreign officials. And then finally, there's a False Claims Act. So that uh, prohibits companies from defrauding the federal government and it legally protects whistleblowers from retaliation. Yeah. So these are kind of like a step up from a regular whistleblower protection. So your company should have a whistleblower protection. We have whistleblower protection mm -hmm. here at Compliance Line. Right. But these are the protections for those corporate officers who blow the whistle. Right. I know that some of our clients, some of these look pretty familiar because we... They do, yes. Where where have you seen these before, other than like in this room on this piece of paper right now? <laughs> Well, actually, I think most um, most of the call, as, as far as this list goes, the False Claims Act it was what we deal with most out uh, out on the floor as far as like the reports and stuff, because we get a lot, what people would call billing or coding errors, you know, from physicians, physicians' offices, where they were charged for something that didn't happen, or there was like an upgrade put on the, put on the bill so that the doctor or the office could get a bigger payout, especially for things like Medicare and Medicaid that's funded by the government. So let's, let's follow that train of thought. Okay. All right. So, so a patient calls in and says, right. Hey, my bill is weird. Right. Right. And we send that to the compliance office. Mm -hmm. Compliance office investigates right. and says, yes, that is weird and it is wrong, but they don't do anything about it. And then the compliance officer sees that it doesn't, they don't, that the company's not doing anything about it. Okay. And then they report it up to the government because that's kind of the train of thought because all of these big compliance officer problems, they start small. Yes. I mean, I would imagine if somebody internally saying, hey, this isn't, this isn't right. It doesn't look right. Right. And they report it up and then either nothing gets done or it's shoved under the rug. And then the compliance officer is in a interesting position where they say, well, this, this was wrong and it didn't get fixed. Now, what do I do? Yeah. So I wonder, um, and this is just me thinking, like, how many of those does it take? You know, is this just one person that got forgotten or has this doctor been doing it for X amount of years? Has this compliance officer seen this, all of this as it plays out? So, I mean, it's just a very interesting question, but it's a, um, 
it would be a very awkward place to be in. I, yeah. I assume. Because you, as a compliance officer, you're kind of bound. It's like being a mandatory reporter, right? right. Like you're, you're, you're bound by compliance and ethics guidelines, but your loyalty also is potentially to the company that right. you work for. Right. Like, I don't want to lose my job for reporting this right. to the government. Uh, I think that's so interesting. I never kind of thought about it like that. Right. Yeah. Now, we want compliance officers to report issues because it's the right thing to do, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, that's that's the heart right. of being a compliance yeah. officer, right? Right. That's, that's where your head needs to be. Right. But uh, there's also uh, potentially a monetary incentive right. for doing this. You could be eligible for a monetary incentive. Mm-hmm. For reporting, if kind of the conditions are right. Right. So a couple of those conditions are if you have independent knowledge of the wrongdoing. So I, I don't get, explain that to me because I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of that stuff would come up just in your everyday job, you know, what, what you do every day. So is independent like knowledge is someone just telling you something happened or? That's a good question. The way, the way I interpret this is, and please, if our listeners or, or watchers on YouTube uh, think that this is, that we're interpreting it incorrectly, please let us know. What I think independent knowledge is, is it's not reported to you. You are the one who you saw it. Ha- correct. Got it. Okay. So it's not like you took a report from the billing, this person that called in about their medical bill, okay. and you're like, oh, I could get paid some money if I you know, kind of sit on this and I don't do anything with it. And then I can report it up to the SEC and uh, I'll be eligible for this huge catch prize, which you were not the one that actually discovered it, the person that made the original report. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's more like you saw Jane slip the salt shaker into her pocket. I, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, you know. Oh, no, maybe or maybe $4 scale. million dollars right. into her account. $4 <laughs> million dollars, shark, salt shaker. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, I, I think you're right because, you know, this is ultimately a show about when the compliance officer, what does the compliance officer have recourse to do? Right. And if you see something, who are you going to report it to? Because generally the compliance officer, we like to think the compliance officer is an important piece of the executive membership of a company. Yes. Right? Our our compliance officer is. Right. So if our compliance officer saw somebody embezzling a large amount of money Mm -hmm. and the only person that that compliance officer has to report that to is the CEO, what what are they going to do? Who are they going to report that to? So if they independently witnessed it or found out that it was happening and had no other person to report it to, they could report it to the government or Securities and Exchange Commission, and then they would be potentially eligible for a monetary reward for doing so. Yeah, some of them seem to be quite large. Yeah, so, yes. And I know why. I mean, because I, I, I guess, like, those compliance officers that do so are in a very bad way and have to consider, is it worth my job? You know, so. Right. Is the one, money, money going to be worth my job? Because ultimately, I guess people are thinking, the way I would think about it is that, you know, they don't have to fire me for this, but down the road, could mm-hmm. I suffer retaliation? Because of this, you know. Yeah, is is this cash award worth me losing my job and potentially being blacklisted right. in my chosen career that I've spent a lifetime getting to, uh, you know, this position? Is it is it worth it? Is is that money worth it? And, and I think that you know we can't answer that. My no, money. but yeah. I, they 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 are seemingly quite large. Um, payouts. Yeah, one of uh one of the payouts we saw a whistleblower who received a payout in March of 2020, so like last month, yeah, who was uh, awarded $450,000 by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um the they were anonymous employee had some compliance duties and what happened is they adhered to the policies and procedures within the company. They reported this uh, this issue, the employee waited uh, the prerequisite based on their protocol 120 days and nothing happened. And so they reported it up 
further, like outside of the company, and were awarded four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that. Yeah, that, I mean that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, but um, the employee also sat, you know, had to kind of wait it out for four months before, yeah. you know, being able to do that. Um, Can you imagine the weight of that? I mean, I couldn't. Like, I would just, I would be so anxious the whole time. Um, so yeah, I guess I mean. I see why the payouts are that large because you have to, you know, it's like a pros and cons. Like, right. Do I, do I do it? Do I not? Do it? Well, the, it, it re, it's important to know that like, that's, that's a very rare occurrence. That $450,000 payout. Okay. It was only like the third time that an individual with compliance duties was awarded a monetary amount for, for those reasons. So it's, it's very rare. So I think for me, that makes it, even more um, hard to process. Yeah. Right, because you're you're thinking about, you're not seeing in the media or online all of these people getting payouts for reporting compliance. So oh, right. I'm sure, I'm sure like, the, the investigations in, are, are very diligent. Like, they have to be very precise, very detailed. So I, I'm sure that doesn't happen. Like, something something's amiss a lot of times or sometimes. So that never comes into play. The money never comes into play. Right. I just can't imagine that it's something that, you know, everybody's doing this. I'm no, seeing no, no. It, it and happening. And what incentive is that for somebody? At the bottom of all things, something must have really been wrong in this situation for them to even say it. Have Yes, have mm -hmm. gone forward. It's not like those commercials you see on television where if you or your loved one has ever had, you know, this disease or that disease, sign up for our class action lawsuit. I mean, it's not like, right. it's not advertised. You don't see it happening a lot. So there really had to have been something wrong for this to have even taken place. I agree. And this, um, this says the, the employee had some compliance duties. So I'm not thinking that this was like um, like a chief compliance officer or right. someone like that. So maybe things would be different, you know, if it, if it's like a, someone on the executive level that that reported it. Like maybe that's that puts them in a harder position, yeah. a more difficult position. What an interesting perspective to think about. I mean, like I know it adds a lot of color for me in <clears throat> hearing these telephone calls and. Working out on that call floor, right. hearing some of the issues that they're raising, and hey, what does happen in the investigation process, and what happens if it's willfully, I don't know, is ignored the right way to say it, or investigated and brushed away? Like how? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we we have seen some substantiated cases. Now, unfortunately, they don't usually share that information with us mm -hmm. or have, you know, or have us read that to the caller um, when he, she calls back to get a response. So that stuff is usually um, not shared, but I can say that we have had substantiated cases that the findings were, this happened and action was taken. Like I was, I was explaining earlier that when we have to call um, other individuals, if a coordinator's listed in a report, not necessarily for financial things, but maybe just HR issues or, or behavior issues or something like that. Like sometimes those people are their subordinates. Mm -hmm. Like if we don't have a corporate contact, like I said, you know, so how does that look? You get in a report about your boss and your boss doesn't get it. And now you know, it's in your hands to put it in other hands to be investigated. Right. And it's, it comes down to that, like, ethics thing. Like, right. I got to do the right thing, and I should do the right thing whether there's a monetary incentive to do it or not. It should be intrinsic, not, right. you know, for, yes. for my pocketbook. But I think ultimately is the risk of, you know, your job or your blacklist in the industry, is it worth, worth it? Yeah. Worth it. So, ugh. Not, I don't, not, not a good place. Not a good place. And I think it's, it's you know, this is a very interesting topic as far as, like, the compliance officers being on both sides of it. You know, yeah. um, the investigator, now you're the... Whistleblower. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it definitely could be a conflict of interest. Yeah. Angela, thanks for coming in. Well, thank you, Amanda. I had such a great time. Yeah. If Interesting you Interesting uh, stuff. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'll let you pick the topic next time. I'll okay, just good. like foist this on you and say, hey, talk about this. <laughs> no, this with was me. great. This was great. I loved it. So I hope you'll come back. I sometime. will. 
I will, whenever you want. Good, great. The Please follow us on our social media. We are on Twitter at Compliance Live. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Compliance Line. And you'll be able to see uh, clips and tips from everything uh, from Compliance Live to the ethics experts and everything in between. If you are not already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you are watching already on YouTube, I just want to go ahead and tell you we apologize for our attire. We are in the <laughs> middle of Spirit Week, and it is Wacky Tacky it's Wednesday. Wacky Tacky and um, I think we took some pictures that we're actually going to throw out on our social media uh, to spread goodwill. Yeah, yeah stay. Keep it wacky. <laughs> <laughs> At least on Wednesday. Tomorrow is your dream job day. So I'm excited to see what everybody comes what dressed up. Uh, I always wanted to be a paleontologist. Wow. So yeah, dinosaurs. Wow. So I've got like this bomb dinosaur dress. Oh yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna wear that. What are you coming as? Um, I haven't decided. I wanted to be so many things as a child. So <laughs> I think I have a lot to choose from. Like anything from a teacher to um, you know, a unicorn. <laughs> Do that one, please. I'm going to do so, a unicorn teacher. Yeah. Well, uh, check out our social media for that. For Compliance Live, I'm Amanda Hosenfeld. I'm Angela Arnhart. And stay compliant. <laughs>